So I wanted to take some time this morning to uh, talk a bit about kind of Google's roots in open source. Uh, my role at this point is really more focused on uh, uh, open source and commercial enablement on top of GCP, uh, Google Cloud Platform itself. But I think given the nature of kind of the folks who are on here um, and as well as just, you know, kind of some of the background material, I thought I would kind of more focus on how what Google's open source journey has been and what we have found, you know, has worked for us and what hasn't worked as well. Um, the thing that I would say is, you know, I have the chat open. Um, if you all have questions uh, that come up while I'm presenting, um, you know, please feel free to either ask uh, ask in the uh, chat window or, as Aaron just said, unmute yourself and feel free to break in and ask questions then as well. Um, so, so we're going to start out with, uh, you know, Google has been in the business of, you know, well, open source for about the last 20 years or so at this point. Um, <clears throat> Oh, sorry, I'm waiting for the window to catch up here. Um, we started out with, you know, kind of first releases of really dense developer tools. Um, and really, you know, you look back 20 years, that was really kind of driven by the engineers and, you know, honestly, the founders of the company at that point who wanted to contribute back to things that, you know, we had written internally. Um, those kind of first releases were important ones for the company to kind of get its, you know, its grounding and its feet within the open source world and kind of set ourselves up for the eventual release of, you know, management of iconic projects like, you know, Android or Chromium or Go or something like that. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I guess is both a joke and a true statement is that uh, I get asked often, well, how does Google manage its open source projects? Uh, the reality is, is that we have tried basically every method to manage them. If you look at the difference, you look at the difference, the Android is run, Android is run, Chromium is operated or Go is operated. We've got different governance structures. You know, Kubernetes is part of the, you know, uh, uh, part of the CNCF, which is part of the Linux Foundation, whereas, you know, Istio is being managed internally. Um, so we have, I would not say it was exactly a plan, but we definitely have uh, tried a wide variety of ways of kind of running these large scale projects as well. Um you know, and that has now kind of driven into some more interesting areas, too. So some of the questions that we're dealing with now is, you know, how do we handle the overwhelming success of something like TensorFlow? And how do we then present it to our customers with cloud AI at that point? And, you know, there's interesting questions like, what does it mean to release Kubernetes as open source, but then be shipping it to our customers as GKE and Anthos as well? Um, so hopefully we'll you know, be able to hit on uh, uh, a number of those points. Um, <clears throat> so first and foremost, uh, you know, Google itself is basically a, a an expression of open source. Um, you know, it is what the company is is it's a bunch of different operating systems. We wrote a bunch of stuff on top of those operating systems, and we have embraced it from the beginning. Um, you know, and so the thing that I, it sounds very kind of hand wavy or wishy washy, um, but it is really built into the mentality of how people do code development internally. Um, you know, the code is made broadly available across all the different, you know, product areas so that people from different teams can inspect, can use, you know, can, uh, you know, can, uh, can make use of the code. I will say as much as I would like that to lead to there being a reduction of, you know, duplicate efforts in different parts of the company, the reality is, is that, of course, there continues to be duplication of efforts because that's how humans work. However, by, you know, bringing those kind of principles of open source internally, and I think it was Tim O'Reilly in like 2002 who coined the phrase inner source, we've been able to also bring some of the open source methodologies to, you know, our inner source methodologies as well of trying to make code be broadly available, broadly distributed and reusable as much as possible. <clears throat> 
So uh, we'll walk through kind of a, a, a short history inside of here. Um, we were, you know, historically speaking, early adopters. What you're looking at here is actually one of the early uh, uh, early pictures of, of the network. It was our last heterogeneous network. Um, and we started out with writing Python on top of Linux, data subsystems in C, ad systems were built on top of MySQL back in 2001. And so, you know, the roots and the usage of open source go back, you know, it's well over two decades at this point. And that has really kind of been the, you know, underlying factor in how we have done everything. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that I wanted to talk about in particular was when you as a company, and I think a lot of your organizations are in this uh, you know, state now, uh, begin contributing to, uh, you know, to, to external projects. So for the very first one that Google had started with, it was early 2000, and it was contributing back to the Linux kernel. Um, we were very careful about how we used it and what we did. All of the changes were kept in a sub-repository. And this is really the time frame where the first uh, OSPO, the Open Source Program Office, started. And uh, the team's very first job at that point was compliance. Um, because as I think uh, most of you are well aware, the one of the biggest challenges with working with open source is how do you create a scalable and reusable compliance process? And that has been one of the uh, most important goals and most important actions that the Jeff, I lost your audio. Uh, there you go. There. Sorry about that. My hub decided that it did not want to display things. So let me just change back to the right camera. And everyone. Uh, your audio cut out again. Oh. Okay, there you are. All right. Good. Back on track. I love USB C hubs. No, really, really, I do. <sighs> yes. <clears throat> so, anyway, um, as I was stating, one of the biggest problems that well, not biggest problems. One of the biggest work areas that we've had has been the ongoing side of compliance. Um, <clears throat> this has been, I think, by far the thing that has remained the most common set of work that we have had throughout all of OSPO, and we will continue to have in the future. Um, so a lot of the work that we have that goes into compliance is simply around creating automated tooling that lets all of the different engineering teams be able to take code either that they have written or that they want to use and be able to run it against, you know, basically a set of license classifiers. And so what we will do inside of there is, uh, so let's say that you are getting ready to release a set of code. Um, we use a unified internal launch process and the open source program team has what a launch bit inside of there. And you as a external team, let's say you're, I don't know, the, the, if you are a new team releasing new open source code, you go through a more, you know, kind of fine grain process where we actually will, you know, sit down, review what you're doing. But over the long run for the larger and more successful project or, you know, kind of the uh, longer running project. So like Angular or something like that, um, we're able to do the training with the team. But after that point, they're able to continue doing their launches on their own. Um, we give them sufficient tooling to be able to run their own kind of, you know, compliance testing. If they ever have questions, you know, particular legal questions or something like that, we give them actually, you know, there's sets of office hours um, that, you know, people can attend. There's a mailing list as well. I will say one of the things that uh, we find to be challenging uh, in particular with kind of the compliance side is actually more the ingestion of uh, AGPL software. And so one of the things that we spend a fair amount of time working with uh, with internal teams is trying to make sure they understand 
how and when they can be using AGPL software and what the usage of AGPL would mean, you know, along with the rest of the you know, uh, uh, you know, software that they're trying to use too. Um, so, you know, the biggest things here was it was starting small and starting deliberately and being able to take notes that, you know, kind of went along with that. But quickly, and by quickly, I mean in the order of a year or two, we were able to bring enough of the information and approach that we were able to, you know, make that uh, a much broader effort at that point. Um, and so, you know, part of the ways that we built up that muscle strength internally uh, for being just you know, a better company at working with open source was a early commitment uh, to the open source projects that we rely on. And so that was important to us because we wanted to ensure as we relied on all of these, you know, these different pieces of software that they were getting a pipeline of new contributors. The other thing that this meant by running these programs like Summer of Code or CodeIn um, was it gave us a deep connection directly with many of those projects that we also relied on as well. And so one of the things that I, I think I would add uh, you know, to, to your list as you're going through and trying to figure out the best way to chart these waters is get a deep understanding of the open source projects that you rely on and how your team is also going to fit in and work with those as well. Um, both because A, you know, rising tide floats all boats, but B, those are going to be groups and areas that are going to be able to give your broader team a lot of expertise in how to work. Um, you know, so, you know, for instance, we, you know, we've been working with the Apache Foundation since the beginning. Uh, I think we just crossed 20 years of working together at this point. We're the first to sponsor Apache. You know, with the Linux Foundation, we helped form it. And we continue to be deeply involved in it, sometimes in ways that are all, you know, happiness and, uh, you know, rainbows, and sometimes having, uh, shall we say, spirited disagreements over, you know, future directions of things. But, you know, that is part of the nature of at least working within the broader open source world. Um, <clears throat> so... You know, as we have continued to grow, we release a lot of projects. So this data point is actually well now out of date because one of the things that we have been impacted with due to COVID-19 uh, is we had to change the entire intern process for this uh, year. So normally we have about 1,100 undergrad interns this year, they are all working from home and, you know, have limited access to our corporate hardware. Um, so what we did is all 1,100 interns are now working on open source code. And what that meant is all the teams that were taking the interns then had to either choose new pro you know, new areas for them to work on that had, were previously open sourced or open source the code. Um, much to our I guess I would say pleasant surprise. Uh, we found that the vast majority of all of the different product areas that were looking for interns went down the route of actually open sourcing the code that they had. Um, so we suddenly went from, I guess we're up to like 20,000 projects or something like that. But it's important to note that a bunch of those projects are just kind of a partial release of software, primarily for the purpose of making it so that the interns would be able to work on it. Um, and so one of the things that I would add that you know, come, one of the things that makes running a successful open source program office uh, challenging is figuring out where you're going to be able to put your actual resources and, you know, kind of which projects are you going to support with it. And so what we've done with a lot of things like these interim programs is it's really kind of fire and forget process where it's, okay, you're taking this code, you're going to release it, we are going to give you a hard set of guidelines for the licenses that you can use to release it. You need to run these things through the compliance engine, make sure that it doesn't violate anything inside of there, but we're not doing a lot of kind of hand build support that goes beyond that. <clears throat> so, uh, and I guess the other thing I, I should add at this point is, uh, currently we've got like 3,100 kind of seven day actives on the different projects that are associated with it. I would say as, 
as these as your own program offices are getting up and running, those those statistics like seven day actives or other things like that, they're useful to have, but you always need to be able to ground that in you know what the actual amount of audience interest is for you know, something like that. Um, you know, like if your potential addressable audience is like a thousand people at a thousand different organizations, well, then, you know, having a hundred seven day actives is a heck of a good number at that point. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so one of the questions that I often end up having to address is, you know, what are the motivations for, you know, source code and release? Um, because, you know, and I can tell from some of the names of folks on here who I've worked with before, these are questions that you all have seen over the last, you know, 10, 20 years of what's the value in contributing to open source? We're not going to make money off of this. I don't see any point in doing this. Isn't this additional time, work, things like that? Um, you know, the truth or reality is, is that, yes, releasing code as open source is uh, extra work. You know, going through the license classification, uh, dealing with, you know, community feedback and issues that are addressed, you know, uh, that come up from that. That is all definitely additional work. Um, however, the thing is, is that, you know, it's, it's the base value of open source. By the code being open, we can drill down and repair our uh, and enhance our own services. That's true for other companies that would be using code that we've released. It is also true for us using code that has been released by you know, uh, another organization at that point. Um, using open source has allowed us in the past to do something out of the ordinary. We can use that source code without showing our hand in what we're trying to do at that point. Um, and so this kind of contribution back to open source is, you know, really opened up a lot of kind of experimental ways for us to work with this as well. The other thing, and this is particularly true, you know, for instance, if you look at Kubernetes, uh, no one is incentivized to hurt us. So in particular for organizations like, you know, this group, for instance, or other kind of more uh, industry focused groups, finding areas of open source projects where that source code means that you relieve a potential kind of chink in the armor or weakness it's a, uh, I, I guess it's co-option by cooperation. I should probably make that a, uh, an entry in the slide. I like that phrase. Um, but removing that kind of incentive to, you know, have that competitive pressure is something that makes an appreciable difference. You know, at some, now at some level, the release of Android is also about ensuring that, you know, we have constructed a, a big enough moat around Android that there isn't a competing, you know, uh, uh, mobile operating system that, that would displace us. Because, frankly, even a Google Play decoupled Android is still a better thing for Google than an entirely different, you know, mobile operating system at that point. Um, the other thing that open source means is that we can control our destiny. Um, you know, that means, yes, Kubernetes, as I said at the beginning, Kubernetes is part of the CNCF. However, we also release Kubernetes as GKE as well. So by, you know, donating Kubernetes to the CNCF, we removed that kind of pain point of incentivization to hurt us and GCP at that point, while still preserving our ability to, you know, kind of innovate and uh, move things forward as well. Um, the last part that, you know, I think the influence computer science and industry and the kind of Google ethic, uh, I could probably remove Google ethic and just say kind of, um, you know, software development writ large. Um, it, you know, there is a study that I was involved with, with Kareem Lakani, who is still at MIT now, that is got to be almost 20 years old. But one of the one of the biggest outcomes from the survey was most open source developers identified the work that they did as, you know, their primary creative passion and, you know, compared it to you know, writing music or writing poetry, you know, which 
well, thankfully for most of us, uh, it turns out writing software pays a lot more than writing poetry or music. So that's worked out better for me. Um, but the thing is, is that people are, people are motivated by, you know, creative interest in what they're working on. And being able to write an open source code, being able to make it, you know, available is not the primary motivator for everybody. But for most people, it makes a good point. Thank you, Tony. And it's good to see you again, by the way. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, Kareem, he's such a good person. Um, yes, Tony just corrected me. He is at HBS. Um, it was his PhD that was MIT with Eric von Hippel, who is still a wonderful person. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, let's see. So one of the things that does come true with these motivations is like, for instance, working within the cloud space, we are trying to compete upon performance of GCP rather than the vendor lock-in side. And one of the ways that we can make that point is by you know, contributing Kubernetes to the CNCF at that point. Um, so let me kind of consolidate down, you know, these different ways that we operate. Um, so within Google itself, we've got, well, as I half jokingly said earlier, we've essentially tried every method of managing large scale open source projects. That was definitely not planned, but here we are. Um, but, you know, oh, and I should add, so the, uh, the open source program office at Google, we are about 44 people in total. Um, that is a large number. I, let me break that down a bit for you. We've got about 15 people in the engineering side. Um, and you've got a split there where about five of the people, five of those engineers are actually working on patent search and being able to do kind of uh, searchable metadata. Uh, and then the rest of the team is focused on, is focused on doing the uh, intern, internal tooling side. The rest of the organization is really a, uh, a program management group and does things like, you know, run cube flow or, you know, does, uh, you know, uh, community management for Kubernetes or areas like that as well. Um, so we've got a good sized team. The problem is, is that's still not anything close to servicing all of the needs that people have, you know, across all of Google. So we kind of break things down into these following categories, which uh, we uncreative, uncreatively have named small, medium, and large because, well, if the shoe fits, wear it. Um, so we've got this example of small, and these are API examples. This is really, uh, I would say, about 60% of the amount of open source releases that we see coming through. It's stuff where a team just wants to make an API available. Or it's a you know, product group that has code that they want to make open as a, you know example for how to talk to a geo endpoint or something like that as well. Or sometimes it's simply a small product that, um, you know, for example, uh, there is, you look this up because I'm not making this up. One of the uh, products that we released is called Cauliflower Vest. It's an anagram for file vault key escrow um, because, of course, you want to use anagrams for that. Um, that was a small project that we wrote internally that addressed essentially a uh, feature oversight within uh, Mac OS's file vault. And we use it as a way we released it to the world. It lets a enterprise do the key escrow management for file vault on the Mac, letting you run a Mac fleet at scale at that point. And that's kind of a good example of, you know, some of these where it goes from small to medium. You know, medium are really teams that are more like five to 10 people on a team. Um, you know, in addition to file vault, uh, in addition to cauliflower vest, we've also released um, uh, it's called what well, we call it Mac pushy internally, but it's a plugin for monkey that again, let's say enterprise do all of its Mac, uh, Mac OS, uh, package maintenance because Apple's tools for that are, well, it turns out when you defund your enterprise support group, you don't build any enterprise tools anymore. So, uh, we had to build all of the Apple, um, enterprise tools. 
And so those medium efforts are things where, you know, what we as the open source program office team will do is hopefully early in the design process, although the reality is, is that most of the time teams don't come in until they're like eight weeks away before releasing. And then they ask, hey, what license should we use and what else should we do to get ready to release? And then we have to back them up and be like, okay, have you picked out a name? Have you talked to the copyright folks yet? Have you talked to the trademark trademark folks yet? And I cannot, I cannot tell you how valuable it is to simply have a freaking checklist to be able to give to the various TLs and PMs of the things that go into releasing you know, an open source project. Because a lot of those things like you know, the copyright around the name or something like that, they just don't tend to occur to many people. So in this case, it turns out there was not a lot of copyrights around cauliflower uh, vests. So that was a pretty easy one to get through. Um, but we'll spend time working with them, going over name collision in the space, walking them through the different licenses, and then basically being able to get them set up along the way. The nice thing is, is that usually that takes about an hour to two hours. And after that point, it's mostly you know, kind of self-serve and self-maintenance because they're doing point releases. They're doing other things like that. Only rarely do we have to get into things like uh, you know, if they want to change a license or something like that. One sub point that I would add to that is particularly around when a uh, project goes from medium to large, that's when we begin to you know, start to get standardized process for uh, community license arrangements. So one of the things that we see coming up, uh, particularly with large projects, is how do you handle outside patches coming in? And there's a bunch of docs that already exist around the web for you know, kind of standard CLAs that you can use. But I will say one of the things as, as you all are running these groups and offices is having a good CLA beforehand to deal with the happy, happy day when you have to say, hey, we have a patch that is coming in for a project that we own but this patch is not an employee of the company that we are at. Having a clear, easy to use CLA that you know, assigns the you know, assigns the the copyright at that point is something that is going to make your your lives and your lawyers' lives immeasurably easier at that point as well. Um, <clears throat> so that is kind of an example of part of what we talk about with these large frameworks. So when I talk about large projects. I'm talking about everything from like Go and Chromium size to Angular to, you know, one point part of Gwit was part of this as well. And this is the area that, you know, most of the folks on here are all at pretty large companies and know all the joys and pleasures that come with dealing with large companies at that size. This is where it becomes kind of a large company thing. You know, you begin to talk about commitments of headcount over the course of, you know, two to three years. What does community support end up looking like? And I wish that I could say that I had a one size, you know, one size fits all model for this. The reality is that it is highly variable. You know, what Android, what, you know, the Android uh, ASOP, Android, the open source project needs they have a very different set of needs that uh, you know, for support that they have uh, than what Kubernetes needs at that point. And uh, really the role that I think most of the folks on this call will end up playing is going to be stuff around how do you differentiate and how do you talk through these different models with each of these area leads. I think the, you know, the, the best advice that I can give is trying to ground the strategic goals within kind of open source as a framework will make for better long-term success. But again, this is one of those things where the needs of these large projects really does end up influencing a lot of how the work that gets done. So, you know, just to be completely transparent about it, what that means for us internally is that, uh, let's say for TensorFlow, um, 
we with an OSPO do almost all of the external kind of work associated with TensorFlow. You know, we have, you know, we've run the conferences, we do the, you know, we run what well, we run the events, run the user groups, we handle all of that part. For Chromium, we give the Chromium team kind of the licensing and tooling support. We also run the whole GitHub instance and everything like that uh, uh, for them. But aside from that, they essentially, we are, we get called and do consulting for them, but they really run everything on the ground and everything uh, like that. So uh, it can be a highly variable model is probably a good way to put it. Um, I am taking more time talking than I thought I would. So we're now going to enter some of the speed round of things so we can get to some of the questions. Um, <clears throat> this kind of gives a example of where we're at. Well, I guess actually where we were at towards the end of 2019 at this point. Uh, this is a number that we see increasing, uh, obviously. Um, in particular, with the uh, over the last year, we have seen more and more of our internal open source projects just moving directly on top of GitHub. Um, you know, frankly, that of course, now that GitHub is owned by Microsoft, that is giving us some degree of, you know, the question is, how dependent do you want to be upon a product that a competitor says they will run at arm's length, but how long do you trust them to run at arm's length? That said, the amount of, you know, the tooling that GitHub provides, their focus now on providing better enterprise support has really made it a no-brainer in many ways uh, for people to be able to, you know, to be using GitHub. Um, so Google contributions on GitHub, uh, over, this has actually been, well, part of both contract negotiations and, uh, internal tooling support that we've been doing. Um, so what we have been doing, what we had been doing up until the end of last year was we had built a bunch of internal tooling that internal, so Googler teams could sign up for our Google GitHub account. And so it could be both person-based and role-based accounts inside of there. And what you would have to do then is teams would sign up inside of there and thus we would end up with a <clears throat> tracking list of what all of the, well, A, the number of different you know, people B, the number of different role accounts and, you know, the bot accounts and things like that. And then C, the total number of projects that we're operating. Um, GitHub's backend or its ability to, you know, kind of give us better data about what people have been doing has been improving quite a bit over the last year. So we have been deprecating some of our old kind of, uh, I mean, basically it was scraping dashboards and then slurping it back into you know, our internal tools and then doing data munching and making the dashboards from there. At this point, so uh, because of how GitHub has changed some of the per seat models, we have begun to request justification if teams or people need more seats. And so that has brought some of that number more back in line with how many people are using on a daily active basis. But we are mostly just pulling the data out by having a, um, because essentially we have an internal gateway where if you're going to be doing Google development, you signed up through there, we know who all the projects are, and then we can pull the, you know, pull all of that information out of GitHub at that point. Um, one of the things that uh, I will file from this that we have been talking about is actually trying to release a bunch of the tools that we have written to manage Google's GitHub work. I'm just trying to make sure I said that sentence correct. I think I did, but the, T, yeah, the, the too long, uh, the shorter version of that is uh, open sourcing the tools that we manage to, that we use to manage Google's open source efforts. Yes, yes, I said all of those things correctly. And it sounds like that is probably something that would be of use and interest to folks on here as well. Um, 
this is just kind of, I, I can breeze through this next one. Some of the example, the projects that we are focused on now, I think one of the things that is interesting to note here is that you can see kind of where the company's, you know, the company's focus has really remained on for our flagship open source projects has really been around kind of infrastructure work and enabling other uh, you know, teams, people's companies to build on top of there. I think at least in the 25 years that I've been involved in open source, that has really been the, you know, kind of the, the area that has made open source most successful has been, you know, kind of focusing on these enabling platforms as well. Um, so this is actually, I guess, nominally my day job. So I should be spending more time focusing on this part. Um, but I'll, I'll just use two and a half minutes on it. Um, the focus that, that the company is really trying to take now, and, and as I referred to earlier, you know, open source, contributing Kubernetes uh, is trying to compete around performance rather than, you know, vendor lock-in. Um, you know, it's obviously no secret that GCP wants to, you know, is competing with both Azure and AWS. Part of how, uh, part of how we think that we can, uh, you know, at least move up into being in the uh, top two inside of there is going to be around prodigious use of open source and making it, uh, you know, kind of a core part of the enabling systems. One of the things that I would love to you know, be able to hear from you all about, whether it's here or whether it's an you know, email afterwards, is what the critical shortcomings are that, that you all see, um, because we want to be able to try to build and address those within, uh, address those, uh, within GCP. Again, for most of the folks who uh, you know, are on here, this is not going to come as new information or anything like that. You know, the shift, especially in cloud and enterprise, has been increasing usage of uh, open source software. That's been at least the last you know, 25 years, and I see no reason that it's going to slow down. I think even taking into account things like the current, uh, you know, kind of Mongo versus AWS and some of the uh, uh, other drama that is happening within the broader open source world. It's still that's that's kind of a sideshow to the main event, which is going to be the cons you know kind of continued commodification of software by this combination of open source and cloud at the same time. Um, my email address is on there. If you also have other questions or want to get more specific information, or of course I'm happy to you know talk with you know uh, y'all individually or with your teams or companies as well inside of there, but. Wanted to make sure we had some time for follow-up questions as well, too. Um, and I'm going to leave this up. Yes. I can shift this tab and see you all. There we go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'm sure yeah. you folks have questions. So um, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, let the questions fly. Well, while we're waiting for that to happen, um, I I will ask my first one. Uh, it's something you and I talked about um, before the call a little bit, Jeff. But uh, you know, we have I, I've spoken to several of our members who put in fairly heavyweight processes for sort of gating and reviewing uh, external contributions um, before they go out the door. Um, yeah. You know, as as their initial process um, for. Uh, reviewing open source contributions and are now realizing that it's something that just won't scale as they try and roll out their open source processes across um, a large enterprise. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what what lessons they might be able to take from Google's experience about how you can uh, how you can ensure that that uh, external contributions are reviewed appropriately but not held up and unduly. Yeah, it's a so it's obviously a non, like, it's a non-trivial problem. And it's one that in particular tends to get a lot of attention from, say, your corporate lawyers or from your compliance teams or things like that because of the perceived risk that goes with it. And yes, there is obviously risk that goes with it as well. I think in in our experience, 
Um, there have been a few ways that, that have made this easier. One, as I was alluding to earlier, is having a clear, you know, a clear CLA for external contributions that you is, is well written and clearly understandable. Because one of the one of the things that I would note is that well, English is still the you know kind of lingua franca of uh, open source. In particular, when you're getting some of these third party contributions that are coming from outside, uh, making sure that you have a CLA that can be translated you know fairly well by you know, so an online translation engine or something like that will definitely reduce any headache whereas you get this kind of back and forth with these contributors that come in. Uh, I should um, have been more clear. I, I meant mm -hmm. um, contributions going out to external. Oh, going out. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, all right, so that is that is the area that is really our evergreen activity. Um, because of course, license, you know, licenses change, what people are using for their systems also change as well. So the challenge that, that we have had is I think, you know, the term Google three is one that, you know, leaked into the press a decade plus ago. Google three is like the internal development system. Um, you know, it is what most of the internal code for Google is written or based on. And, you know, historically, that represents the vast majority of all of the source code that gets written in Google. Um, that has changed, uh, in particular, as more and more stuff has been open source, more and more now gets written, you know, and stored in GitHub or things like that because they're open source systems. So what we have had to do is, you know, we, we early on developed a license classification system uh, for our internal systems. Um, so back in whatever it was, 2010 or so, when Google Buzz launched and then Google had to enter into the consent decree with the FTC, that actually turned out to be a wonderfully good thing. Because what that consent decree meant with the FTC is that any external launches had to go through a legal and privacy review because that was the consent decree with the FTC. Um, what that meant is that because every launch had to go through that process, that meant that every launch now had a way that it was being reviewed. We then, within the open source team, piggybacked on top of that. And what we have is, I mean, it's called the open source launch bit. And what it is, is that if you are releasing any external software, you have to go through the privacy and security review. If there is any open source code that goes with it, you have to flag that and then you get sent through our launch review process at that point. I will note there is obviously a you know, possibility for human failure inside of there since we are reliant upon the you know, either product managers or tech leads you know, to be able to say, oh, yes, this is open source. I should go through the open source review. Um, there has been like in the last 10 years, I could like count on one hand, even if I'd had a wood saw, uh, like a, a wood shop accident with that hand, the number of times that we've had problems with it. Because the, the reality is, is that all of the people who want to release this stuff, they want to talk about it. They want to talk about it being open source. So the number of times that we've had like, you know, false negatives has been, I think, precisely two. And, you know, that's really... It turns out you can rely on humans wanting to get credit and attention for the things that they are doing. So as long as you can give them that pathway to be able to say, this is what I'm doing and this is how I'm launching, you can pretty reliably uh, figure that, that you're going to hear about it. What we did then from the very, at the very beginning, it was a hand milled system where essentially we would be, you know, talking to the TL, talking to the PM, taking a look at what code they were using, and then saying, okay, this looks good or not, you know, does not look good. One of the things that we have shifted to, and this is, I would say, 10 to 12 years ago, was, yes, there is still a part where you submit a ticket to us. You know, we have a compliance, you know, a licensed compliance team that actually will go in and look at it and, 
you know, it's just, it's a ticket interface. So we can just make sure you're not doing anything truly insane. And then the code itself uh, gets uh, pushed over into a uh, code classifier. The code classifier runs through the code, make sure that there's no problems with it at that point. I will note that this is something that, you know, we continue to put time and energy into. Uh, we actually have been talking with the author scan code about doing some more extensibility to the system that, you know, we have built internally. Um, so I guess the, you know, the lesson that you should take from that is uh, trying to roll your own uh, is probably going to end up being painful and, uh there's probably a pretty good opportunity for actually releasing a uh, open source one that would be able to be more broadly used as well and if there are folks who are interested in talking more about that i would love to be able to get a coalition of the willing together around trying to build said system because yeah the uh, the whole notion of keeping up to date with all the different licenses like we make it somewhat easier by saying, essentially, if you are going to release code at Google, we want you, unless you have a really strong reason not to, we would like you to release it either as, you know, uh, under the Apache or the MIT license, because that gives us less headache to deal with over the long run. Um, and that has actually made things a lot easier as well. Having an informed opinion around what license you want your company to use as its default and baseline is something that is going to make your life easier in the long run. And honestly, using stuff like, you know, the BSD or MI, you know, MIT license also is going to make life easier for you in the long run as well, too. Um, let's see. So, Mike, I see new to data availability to the advances AI. Ah, uh, data. So data is a fun one um, because there's actually literally a email chain that I'm dealing with right now about that. So one of the fun things that we're dealing with right now is a team internally wants to use a piece of software that is written under the AGPL to generate test data for use within a you know proposed ML system. And we're we have this whole back and forth right now about whether or not to use the AGPL software because then possibly everything that was, you know, all of the data that was created by it would need to be open sourced and released as well. Um, so Mike, uh, the real, I guess I would say the answer to that is we're getting there, but it's been a more fraught process than we would have thought. Um, so speaking completely uh, candidly, there has been enough news over the last kind of couple of years about training AI and ML data sets and implicit bias that exists in previous data sets that that has put a uh, put put the brakes on wanting to release a lot of these broad training sets, and that mostly comes around wanting to ensure that the data sets that are released are actually free of any implicit bias that is associated with that. And so, you know, famously, you know, it's things like most of the AI or ML vision-based systems. Uh, turns out that when you feed them 60 to 70 percent white people, guess what? They're super good at classifying white people. Not so great at classifying, oh, you know, the majority of the rest of the human race. Um, and so a lot of what we've been trying to do is make sure that the data that we release is actually along those lines is stuff that is actually going to be functionally useful and that we're not baking in some of these biases from the very beginning. Um, uh, industry wise though, and to your broader question, what we're trying to figure out is the best way to release the, you know, release this data, uh, in a way that is also economically feasible to use as well. 
So, you know, one of the challenges that we have been seeing is, well, challenge, I guess, in some to some degree, this is also a sales opportunity for the cloud team, is just how much bloody money it takes to be able to train the new, uh, you know, a new ML or AI based system. And even with the ability to kind of create data to be able to feed the system with, it just gets really, really expensive really quickly to run these systems for long enough that they generate useful information. Um, so the short, <laughs> the semi short answer is we're trying to figure out a way that we can release open source data while also making it economically viable for companies who don't have as much money to spend on these training models to actually be able to use it at that point. Uh, because one of the worries is, is that if we just release these large data sets, that'll just be seen as a way to essentially channel stuff, uh, you know, GCP resources at that point. Um, and no one wants to kind of uh, be stuck with that. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, <coughs> anybody else, questions? Hi, it's, it's Jungji from Itao. Uh, I have a question related to the access to the repositories and which uh, internal repo you use. Uh, just curious yeah. to use GitHub and how the contribution from the engineers, uh, if they would, uh, if they contribute to an internal uh, and mirrored uh, repository and then it's pushed out or if they push directly to the repo, but uh, through some proxy routing, it will go through this uh, review process? Yeah, so at this point, um, they are for, they are decoupled systems. So if you are working in Google 3, uh, which is like, I mean, originally it was a, you know, so originally going back a long time ago, that was all based on Perforce. It now, it was replaced a decade plus ago with a internal replacement uh, for version control. And if you're working on Google 3 code, and you are working on, I don't know, let's say it's ad, you know, something in ads or something like that, you are going to stay within that uh, G4, we call it, that internal repository. You're going to be using all internal tools. And that is a complete island from the, you know, from any of the GitHub work. Anything that is going to be over on GitHub is going to be only open source projects can be using that for development at this point. And there is a proxy, like we do use a proxy for people to be able to connect to that, but that's really just for like user authentication or things like that. So at this point, at least, we keep the source code completely, it's not air gapped, but literally air gap, but it's air gap ultimately. And we don't do any pushing from, you know, from one to the other. Over time, that might change, but um, I have a, it is very difficult for me to see any time in the near future where that really would substantively change because of just the internal security concerns about having a, any sort of explicit tie between our internal code repository and GitHub at that point. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm. So allocate resources to Google and projects like Go versus Google created projects like Kubernetes. Uh, so the real answer to that is it varies, which is not a helpful answer. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so the reality is, is that uh, most of those decisions kind of come up we try to not ship our org chart would be the first answer to that question. And, you know, as any large company, of course, that is always the worry is say, you know, a director, an engineering director who is responsible for Go may just happen to have more headcount open than the one who is responsible for Kubernetes. 
Um, and that really isn't how things should, you know, operate. Um, the functionally speaking, the company has gotten a lot more disciplined in particular over the last, uh, I would say, four years in how we actually do kind of do effort tracking overall uh, across all the different engineering efforts. So to you know, again, being completely transparent, four years ago, it would have been incredibly difficult for me to actually answer with any degree of reasonableness how many people we had working on Go versus how many people we have working on Kubernetes versus how many people we had working on you know, Chromium or something like that. So one of the first things that we did was actually just build better tooling to be able to track who the hell was working on what in what areas. Uh, I will be, uh, uh, our, our ability to, we're much better now at being able to track kind of people who are working on areas. The honest truth is, is that then trying to marry that data with things like operating expenses is just spreadsheets at the end of the day and people like me having to chase people down and dank them and ask them for resources. Um, and what we end up doing within the open source program office is because we have the broadest view of open source across Google is that we end up kind of being the shepherd group that says, Here's all the different groups, including OSPO, including the engineers and all these teams that are working on this particular effort. You know, so it, say it's Kubernetes. And so we'd be like, well, we've got three people on community management and there's 20 people in the engineering team. And obviously I'm making these numbers up, but you know, we'll put together these kind of, if you think back to that small, medium, large framework, we do like essentially a competitive analysis for those large projects and then it's really during planning cycle is making sure that it gets in front of the appropriate, you know, VPs. One of the things that the company has done that has helped uh, some of this is really consolidating some of these projects. Um, so that Go and Kubernetes and Istio and all of kind of these cloud focused open source projects actually all roll up under one uh, director and one VP at this point. But the truthful, like the reality is, is like the decisions that we make around Kubernetes and Go have no impact at all in terms of how much support, say, Angular is going to get or something like that, because it's just being funded out of a whole different part of the company. One of the things that I have given our OSPO team as a challenge for this year going into next year is how do we better articulate for the entire company where each set of resources is going into and kind of, uh, you know, could do a better job of being able to, I don't know, navigate that or give kind of more useful feedback to the, you know, to the engineering teams. But the short answer to it is, we built better tooling to track what people were doing. Um, we, within the OSPO team, uh, track the efforts across the company and then consolidation of the engineering reporting lines made it where we got to much saner choices about what was being done. To answer the last part of the question about outside projects versus internal, a lot of that really comes down to what I was referring to at the very beginning of we make sure that we get broad representation of Googlers across all the different kind of technical or you know uh, boards of the open source projects that matter to us. And they really become advocates for, no, we shouldn't be putting these five heads in to go. This work that needs to go into Maven uh, really matters. And so we call that whole work stream kind of the upstream contributor work stream. And really the effort over the last two years has been trying to turn that into kind of a top tier uh, voice within all of the planning groups. Because historically doing upstream contributions has been something that we have not done uh, as good a job at as we should have in terms of weighting relative priority. Um, again, I, 
Uh, BatesJ at Google.com. I'd uh, be happy to talk with any and, any and all of you. Uh, I realize I'm over time, though, so uh, thank you all for, for the time. Jeff, thank you so much. This has been incredibly informative. I feel like we've gone on for another couple of hours, but I will I will spare you, but maybe maybe we'll invite you back soon. I really appreciate the generous offer to speak with folks one-on-one, -on -one, um, and, you. and I'm sure you'll be taken up on it. So uh, thanks so much, Jeff. That sounds great. Thank you so much, folks, and I'll, I'll look forward to uh, talking to some of you who I haven't seen for a while again, and some of you who uh, hopefully I will be able to talk to. But have yourself a great day. All right, you too. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.